Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center, I wanted to welcome, welcome you to this evening's program. My name is Quentin Ring, and I am the executive director of Beyond Baroque. For those who don't know, we are a literary space located in Venice, California, and we are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing and presenting contemporary literature and art. Tonight, we're very honored to have two exceptional poets joining us, Paul Evangelisti and Dennis Phillips. Um, before we get started, uh, I wanted to acknowledge Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their land. I also want to say a few words about Beyond Baroque's programming. For the time being, our programming remains entirely online. Uh, we do have a variety of writing workshops coming up. These include a one-day master class with the poet Bridget Bianca, a six-week course on the literary submission process with Sochi Julissa Bermejo, and also in May, a workshop focused on Ramadan and political organizing with the poet and activist Taz Ahmed. Uh, additionally, we have our ongoing free weekly workshops. On Wednesdays, we have poetry, uh, our Wednesday night poetry workshop, which is currently being facilitated by Beth Ruscio. And on Mondays, we have our, our Monday night fiction workshop with Raquel Baker. Please do check all of those out at beyondbaroque.org. Um, we can provide more info about them in the chat as well. Um, additionally, next Thursday at this very same time, we're hosting a reading celebrating Lynn Thompson, who was recently named LA's new poet laureate. Laureate, she's, she'll be joined by Hiram Sims, Gail Ronsky, and Mariano Zaro. Um, I pl please do uh, join us for that as well. Uh, finally, I want to mention that on May 6th, we're going to be hosting an online fundraiser entitled Beyond This Moment. It's going to have, it's going to be an evening of readings and mu music featuring um, a number of great uh, poets, artists, actors, musicians. Um, it'll include um, our own alumni, uh, Amanda Gorman, um, the Pulitzer Prize winner, Tehemba Jess, um, the musician Louis Perez of Los Lobos, um, the guitarist Wayne Kramer of MC5, and many, many others. Uh, we'll be announcing the full lineup and tickets next week. Um, I, I really hope you'll be able to join us. Um, all proceeds from that event will go towards Beyond Baroque's programming and towards helping us reopen. Um, in a similar vein, too, we'd be thrilled if you would consider making a donation tonight to Beyond Baroque via a chat, uh, via a link in the chat, um, or by going to our website. It really does help us sustain us during the ongoing uh, difficulties caused by COVID-19. Um, Tonight, we're thrilled to have Paul Evangelisti and Dennis Phillips with us. Um, I'm particularly excited to host this reading because Paul and Dennis are two legends of Los Angeles poetry. Um, the, this evening's readings, uh, the occasion of it, uh, is Paul's new book, Motive and Opportunity, and Dennis's new book, Mapa Mundi. Dennis was just telling me, um, you know, the book came out in 2019, but he hasn't been able to read from it due to, due to the sort of COVID lockdown we've all been enduring. So I'm really thrilled to, to be able to host both of them in their reading. Um, and I'm also glad to have them here together because they've been friends and collaborators uh, for, for a good long time. I think every poet in Los Angeles owes um, both of them and their collaboration a great deal of gratitude because um, their work jointly has really sustained Los Angeles as a locus of avant-garde poetic discourse over several decades now. Um, and Beyond Baroque in particular is indebted to them um, because they've contributed extensively to our work over many years. Um, Paul's been very involved for, for several decades, and Dennis um, himself was director of Beyond Baroque from, I believe, 1984 to 1987, um, and really we wouldn't be here without him. So thank you both, um, and thank you, Dennis, in particular. Um, just to tell you uh, a little bit more about each of their work, Paul Vangelisti is the author of more than 30 books of poetry, as well as being a noted translator from Italian. His book of poems, Motive and Opportunity, was published in fall 2020. Um, in 2015, he edited Amiri Baraka's posthumous collected poems, SOS Poems, 1961-2014 for Grove Press, 2006. Lucia Reyes, in his translation of Emilia Rosselli's War Variations, won the Premio Flaiano in Italy and the Penn USA Award. In 2010, his translation of Adriano Spatola's The Position of Things collected poems, 1961-1992 was awarded the Academy of American Poets Prize. From 1971 to 1982, he was the co-editor co with John McBride of the literary magazine Invisible City. City. And from 1993 to 2002, he edited um, 
I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, um, Raibo, the annual report of the College of Neglected Sciences, uh, the Net National Endowment of the Arts awarded uh, Paul one of his first translation fellowships in 1981 and a poetry fellowship in 1988. He lives now in Pasadena. Dennis Phillips is the author of 17 books of poetry, most recently Mapamundi, um, as well as Desert Sequence, Measures, as well as Navigation Selected Poems, 1985 to 2010. His work, both poetry and commentary, regularly appears in various national and local poetry journals. His first three translations of, work, of works by Mili Graffi and Susanna Rabiti, um, and the Rabiti was with Paul Vangelisti, came out in 2018 and 2019 from Margaret Books. In 1998, he edited and wrote the introduction for a book on the early essays of James Joyce, Joyce on Ibsen. His novel, Hope, came out in 2007. Uh, Phillips is a professor of the, in the Department of Humanities and Sciences at Art College, uh, Art Center College of Design, where he has been teaching literature and writing since 1979. Um, just to describe the program tonight, um, Paul and Dennis are actually going to start off reading from a collaboration they did called Mapping Stone. Um, and then after that, we'll have Dennis read from his latest book, Mapa Mundi. And then we'll finish with Paul's reading from his new book, Motive and Opportunity. Um, really just very grateful to have both of you here. And I'm grateful to all of our audience for join us, joining us. Um, Paul and Dennis, I will go, at, go ahead and let you take it away from here. Oh, one more thing. Please do buy their books. Um, we have a link in the chat. It really does support their work. Um, anyways, take it from here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Quentin. Yes, Hello, Paul. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, all of you people that we can't see, but um, I thought teaching on Zoom was bizarre, but not being able to see all of you is, <laughs> it takes it to a new level of bizarreness. Oh, um, so you wanna say something? No, I was gonna say par for the course, right? Yeah. So um, in 2013, I think it was, Yeah. we, I mean, I almost hate to admit how these things go, but I had a chance to apply for a grant at uh, the college where I teach. And um, I am very bad at coming up with ideas for things like that. So I called Paul and said, give me an idea. And he gave me the idea, which turned into this book, Mapping Stone. Um, and so uh, we collaborated with two artists, Courtney Gregg and William Xeda. And we spent some time uh, in and around the area that called Lunijana, or the Romans called it Lunijana. Uh, and um, one of the things that we were thinking about were these ancient stele that no one exactly knows uh, the provenance of, and, or there are theories about what they were for, but there are these interestingly contemporary looking sculptures to us. They look like Henry Moore might have made them. And they were discovered all over the region. Uh, for example, when workers were digging trenches to lay pipe or whatever, they would discover these things. Regional folks had used them as lintels for doorways and things to hang mailboxes on. I mean, they, they, were, they weren't treated as these kind of a paleolithic or post paleolithic Neo neolithic, Neo neolithic. Neo neolithic sorry i got the wrong we're, stones. we're paleolithic yeah they're, the wrong yeah. stones as always so um so that became that that became the origin of the work what got interesting and complicated for especially for me and courtney while we were there courtney greg is one of the two artists she's also my wife and we're we were all playing with different degrees of of uh, being of being in a place but not of the place. And so what those um, stele mean for Paul, whose family is actually from that region, um, was completely different than what it meant for for me and my my people's nomadic roots and my wife's uh, sort of Anglo roots. And so what what was going on for for me and Courtney was, kind of dealing with that sense of tr trying to figure out what that, what that otherness, what that strangeness is. The, the Italian word 
for someone who's a foreigner is stranieri. So we're we were automatically strange. Um, so I don't uh, that, that may be too much information. Uh, the operation was we uh, we decided to each write Paul. I mean, this was Paul and I did our text, and then William and Courtney responded to the text. And I'm sorry that we don't. I didn't even think to make slides. I could have been showing them uh, on this while we're doing it, but it just now occurred to me that we might have done that. But um, the idea was we each wrote a nine line poem. We, Paul and I, when we've worked before, we seem to like nine line poems. And the, I believe we began with 10 or 11 syllable lines, but that sort of went by the wayside most yeah, of the time. Yeah. And we uh, also uh, allowed each other to use footnotes. Uh, so you will see also later when I read from my work, I'm very fond of footnotes. Uh, so anyway, yeah. and, and uh, Paul, so they respond to each other. Paul's gonna go first and I will read my pieces which respond to his. Yeah, so we'll read the poem and the footnote each. And the footnote. Yeah. Like tigers of remorse, frozen in stone, ever defiant in their hierarchy. Here they come with all that's missing. There where mountains inform the sea, stone, a way of life like any other. Border music in the eyes of a morning, chasing mist down the lush curving valley. Hardly the footprint of an abstract people who carry exile like a willing hunger. How to accrue endings if the eye seems easily enthralled and often outmeasured even by an act of momentary pleasure. It's early, or at least it's early somewhere. Or given what cats or crews drag in, it's later than's dreamt of in our philosophy. It's early enough if you follow the thread. In this case, Clotho's made it in marble, or so we'll say in Carrara's shadow, that sandstones up into a labyrinth, as clear as the bells sounding this Sunday against a base figured in Borshot and the footnote. The thread of limestone reminiscent of the expression clear as mud, mud not as condiment but fundament as in the earth upon which shot rains down arrows of lead. And the silence, that splendid indifference of sandstone cliff and river rock, whose green verge cursing dark pubic with pine and chestnut toward evening sun. And of course, stones ancient, dazzling poverty, whose virtue tolerates every question, every chisel, decapitating the previous question. Each night, centipede emerges from the hole high up on the kitchen wall to watch. If it squints like a duck, grins like a duck, then it's just another citizen trying, as the poet used to say, to keep one's distance if one can. Clotho spins another yarn. This time the fog's thread forms words in a language without a voice that aspires to, if not silence, then at least a faint whisper. Who was it tried to write paradise? And by that I really mean to say that I may like the stairs, the bread may taste fine, but paradise or not, they can never be mine. I keep forgetting about the stele. Skies, skies and more skies, omens of what's to come or what has come or won't stop or more simply where one's been. From the sky, you might see how glad, vague or disappointed you've become as with these lush hills from stark mountains rushing northwest to the sea. As when a boy waiting for the bus along an avenue of wind and sun, you were sure of future endless and chill as the Pacific. He began to write far as the reddening ocean 
but then it couldn't have been like that, sounding more like a memoir than the first year of high school. And after all, it had been Gary Street in San Francisco, late autumn of 1959, staring at the salmon sky in a way one never dared with anybody's eyes or face. Between time and money and the fine line between commerce and the way to the river, or more, between layers of reflection in the museum's vitrine, then back again to time and money and the quality of things made in sandstone and paper. Paul, I'm waiting for you in the shadow of the Piazza d'Italia as calm as a marble saint out of line once again. The footnote is, if you wait long enough in a single spot, a president of the United States is bound to pass. The empire shadows cast long and only now just beginning to run out of line. But what I want to change, but I want to change the subject from time and space to space alone as form, an old thing, a creator god, a succubus. The fantastic hardly makes for music. Music does. Not the perception of heels, but that firm brazen sound on sidewalk very late on an empty windless night in an empty corner of the city. Rock unearthed, peculiar lines upheld and worn by millennia, bearing silence. It isn't poetry, but something before, hardly fantastic and like silent music. Though at the heart of the undertaking, to risk failure isn't enough. One must make one's way to the silent lake, to the words that speak and the text or country that reads you. One line disappears, makes the other clearer, like watching a file of ants foraging where even telephone calls aren't easy. It doesn't get any more fundamental than perching on river stone, recording the shift of weather, the softening light, or more obscure, by which I mean only that it really doesn't matter if one's allotted strings spent watching ants or deciphering the stele on which they walk. The footnote is, there are several strata of being strange. Feeling the history of hunger as a palpable sorrow may be transferable like translation and like translation imperfect. Another ending or voice holding fast the earth, easily the measure of stone and he a healing words haven't yet devised. Even with proof destroyed or any likeness, the exiled life wants native pleasure less momentarily than before. Once the heart heats and cools what's finally come or thought to be unloosed in accruing all that rugged pleasing of a face. Rock, paper, scissors. Of the two voices that speak within, one cracks wise with the native and fast disappearing accent of San Francisco, a garrulous lilt somewhere south of Boston and probably gone to sea. Rock, paper, scissors. Let me give a footnote to the footnote. Uh, Paul has done a huge amount of work uh, with and around the poet Adriano Spatula. So the poet referenced here is uh, Spatula. History in a wall, history in a slab of rock in the land of sandstone and marble, one aggregation, then another, aggregate on aggregate in an external but secretive place, autumn on the terraced land, on the unmolested steepness, stone polished in the town hall, in the riverbed, manners polished enough to obscure the position of things. Once long ago, it was the history of bowls and weather and history haunted the poet almost more than anything and in all their forms. 
the widow quotes her late poet, another layer to the problem of knowing, not the relation of spouse to spouse, but again, the outsider's dilemma. The late one remarked on the nature of old walls and more permanently on their position. Another far earlier, de rerum natura. Not choosing a name or chance, but abiding with distances and often casual move in the balance of things. Slow sequence with eyes shut, a forfeit of being and mostly one's undoing. History's object, shadowing dream, that young boy lost in puddles. Paradise, it seemed, and was mistaken for strangers or strangeness. Here, 50 years ago, wrote Slate, where now in fault failing eye, the terracotta roofs are nearing noontime. In the land of Chiaro, in the land of Oscuro, relief everywhere, your hips in my hands, your map never on the edge of connection. As magnetic of force as ever two planets exerted, no matter the disasters, no matter the currents misunderstood to feel our idiom under our feet, over our heads, in the land of our language, our relief. The shifting pronouns from this side of the legend, a mere reference to the shifting position of the nature of things. Time is the evil, evil, the master wrote up the coast from here in Rapallo. The master seeming then before the war at the end of his own road, which road or war relevant only to poets and other pilgrims of hope. Only beauty's idol might even misplace such an occasion. An investigation must begin somewhere as with any working class art or science. The other voice as defiant bears the mannered crisp inflections of the Apuan Apennines, as well as a, as a distinctly feminine tone. Here, there, paper, scissors, rock. She'd landscape he'd wrap up a nursery, the currency of lines focused as maps, controversy enough as waters rise to visit on the lowlands a plague supreme of locusts, frogs, pestilence, and temper, who among them threw the first tantrum. Imagine the caesura if only girls had wrestled the angel. Imagine how topographic the coded answer. The ancients left messages in our slumber, in common falsettos that forecast dreaming, especially at this age. It's a real hoot, fart noises at all, which doesn't quite mean anybody's looking right at you. The time of year when feelings roar like the plague and grammar makes it a little easier. Take the day, the week, the month off. Mouthless faces await you and it's not yours to tell. The rock works smooth and flowing like this river to the flaming west, a land of wanderers and exiles, ambulanti in local practice, pilgrims by a happier name, a pleasure that comes with age. Here are fogs, Pacific blankets, guys, broad in its address. There, Magra's slim fog fingers sliding up river valleys, different in approach, or is it just a matter of perspective? Hands heel versus digit, cover versus probe, ocean versus creek. If you sit high enough, it's about the line, at least in that continuity's less geography, more mental map. It's high noon in the Bahamas, the mildest of seasons in the Catskills. Line or line, 
for that matter, a detour or treason in the valley of the moon. Three clicks with the alluvial granite, lunch in the redwoods, she not quite willing to play. Speaking of ambivalence, what about Clotho's thread and the daughters of marble in the legend of the Magra? Those mouthless legends, no matter how many clicks or lunches or how old the redwoods, organize we must or the moon will leave us speechless, thread spinners, bearers of ambivalent frontiers in our assigned role as captains. It may be all about the journey, but when you arrive to presentments of doom, should you look to the weather or offer biscuits and vodka to the spinner of thread? Or is it best just to ignore them, go to sleep against the weight of custom and practiced repetition, wish them silent, save the offerings for those in need and remember that lines have no content. That is the end of that. That is the end of that. And that was eight years ago. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. So um, I'm going to read from, uh, to continue the, both the mapping theme and the theme of the line. Uh, I'm going to read two pieces, one from my book Mapamundi that came out uh, as Quentin mentioned a bit ago. And uh, I'm going to begin with the opening piece for the sequel to uh, Mapamundi, which is called The Cartographer's Lament. And uh, it is simply called Apostrophe. It's in a few sections. It's got a bunch of footnotes. I'll try to be polite as I interrupt myself. Apostrophe one of holidays and rituals, of re records kept, of distinguishing signal from noise, of doling out what's doleable, of highways and light torrents, of time and space combining as we understand them to combine, of the physical, actual impediments we must confront to get to be of the witnesses or agents, be they you or someone called they. Damp sun angles off leaves and pavements, pre-winter light from the south. The world falls apart and all we conjure is weather. Oh, transparent messenger, tangible in evocation and then not tangible at all of pressure and compression, a meteorology of steam. And the line, O oh, transparent messenger has this footnote. Tilted meridian, rivers of atmosphere, longitudes ribbon, the wanderer wound in weather. Gradually the steam, sorry, gradually the stream comes into focus. And speaking of intangibles, the leaves drop at the approach of solstice, latitude being what it is. Voices braid and unbraid, floating just beyond until retrieved, plucked, really, to bind to something else made of sound. And the voices sometimes attach to, but always separate from faces and bodies, from shadows sorting shadows. Traces of winter light percussions, refractions, incidental angles bounced off the shed rails of the city, the covered deserts, the islands off the coast. Winter's trace lodged in shadows, in the obliquity of shadows, in shadows of shadows, concussions and recapitulations, pavement soaked and dried, native habits, magnified, repeated. Two. Dark morning damp, as air beneath a waning moon, 
demon sky, early glimpse of color as the blanks fill in. Above, roiling cloud and cries of birds too high up in the current. The world flees us and all we conjure is weather. This basin, Arroyo Seco, ridged by pressures that insist on the desert's cryptography. The Pianto d'Ariana, a different key of abandonment, the labyrinth escaped easier to understand than the labyrinth of pressures and currents. Ariadne, betrayed, resolved into Locatelli's suite, more organized, more harmonious than anyone's idea of chaos. It's that at the mouth of the labyrinth, one's search for string compounds urgency. You can't live in the counterpoints, can't live in the thing made of words. And the couplet that goes, it's that at the mouth of the labyrinth, one search for string compounds urgency has this footnote. Spin, measure, cut. Spin, measure, cut. Three. Death doldrums in humid air. Sleep an uneasy rival, though airplanes intervene in flights of other sorts. Dim, unburied memories that rebury at dawn. And still you hide your signal in the architectures of noise. And it's, I just wanted to jump in. There's a little bit of a phone ringing in the background. If uh, I could probably stop that. I didn't, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I... It's bad showmanship. I hope that no one could hear it. Okay, my bad. Yeah. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. I, I figured it might be best. Apologies to everyone. Yeah, I, I couldn't. It, yeah, it's coming from there somewhere. I tried turning mine off, so uh, it wasn't coming from here. It, it wouldn't be a Zoom reading without something going slightly awry. If it hit one thing, it's another. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I remember reading at San Francisco State once, and uh, I thought things were going pretty well when some terrible noise started happening, and it, and it never stopped for the rest of the reading, and it ended up being an ice machine in the room next door. And at Beyond Baroque in the old days, inevitably it was the sirens from the fire station next door that would, uh, you know, go off right at the most unopportune moment. So anyway, this is the fourth section from the apostrophe that opens uh, the cartographer's lament. Your entrances and exits in the shadows of pages no more dreamlike than the landscapes you keep moving from city to desert to island to ocean. Who can trust the shadows or the umbra's red darkness when your caprice turns them to contraries? You laugh at the idea of thought and I can't blame you. So much for schedules. I know you're listening and doubt it and who you are and why I'd address you if I knew. More than landscape and weather, you're not unlike virtue, hope, or gravity. But why is it that when you show up, a pressure wave of words precedes you? Words that effloresce and images too and harmonies that move like tides, flooding and neeping. I need to believe you're the other half of this voice, the necessary catalyst to complete the contract. At a different time or with a different person, might this whole thing or you simply have been called prayer? And the couplet, I need to believe you're the other half of this voice, the necessary catalyst to complete the contract has this footnote. I take a breath from you confused. Arrest, a theft, you respond by not responding. Is that as I wished it? I 
And now I'm going to read from Mapa Mundi. If you can read it, I can't tell if you can see it or if it's too bright. Yeah. I thought these kind of went together because they have a similar mechanism. Uh, this is called Prelude with Water. One, not doors, not a root of evil, not the magnet of demons, not lyrics of a missing song. Your face looking over my shoulder reflected down the arcade, though I remember an invasive chill as we race through the terminal, but that without air around them, our eyes blurred, our colors dulled. Like music, there's no way to capture water in the markings of language. Sweat dries salt on skin, dead sea concentrations. And here we pause as age insinuates predicates and simple seamanship looms heroic, or seeing her once small leave, no matter how metaphorical still, we're talking water now, something needs to fill the moats, though apostasy and self-consciousness distract from the matter at hand. Ubiquity is never easy, nor governance, nor assertion. Music also impossible like language, like fluids, like a drying slice of something once moist. Two, where the level sought rests, where the plum resides. Take this out later, but the fair truths that the measure is corrupted and no measure reads truth. Knowing when the cisterns holds half the battle. So, neo formalists, how tell the difference between seems and is, if not by architecture? But if by level I mean surface, and by surface the thousand shocks that flesh is heir to, and by this I mean to employ cartographers of water and ambition, what's the calibration of equilibrium's tools? Where the nozzle? Where the drain? Three, the line, plum or story or shroud of a ship, the lines, the transfer of motion, the lineation of words, of seduction, the doubt inspired rhetoric and the proof of lineage as entrance to the game, the question of what comes first and what anyone means by ontogeny. Four. You come a glisten and the currents inform you. I am cavitated, lonesome on the swell. You are both a figure of speech and a voice formed propelling through the medium, understood in this case to be water. And the line and a voice formed propelling through the medium has this footnote. Europa seduced rides outward, details cover her. Warm wind shrouds her arms, currents sweep in. A crete we can't find still sends its missives. Her arms freed, even as the divine bovine swims out to sea, the beautiful, reillusioned, warm one astride. Five, who's left a polishing the corner and who's a guessing which figures on the shore touch the ground or stain the book cover? A guessing who swims the river between and where the reason is in making things of words. Six, raised cups, obliging nobles, darker seasons than expected. Hence the call for differing astronomers with data separate and special, the better to push back the times. 
let's not push under something we don't understand, advisors say, while the distracted can't stop thinking about rhythms as ratios. Where are the postcards? Why doesn't anyone write the chorus in tones while we express our darker purpose? Seven, there's no, there's no shift quicker or more extreme than the slip beneath the skin of surface, pool or ocean, river or lake, except of course the shift we can't know but may hope to. On the banks of sticks, raves abound, nervous limbs, liminal bindings, shades induced to reason crowd the shore. Morning's quotidian experiments find steam and chill as floating heads and stroking arms emerge from water's fog. But the acute address is never that engaging, never alluring enough to follow for long, no matter how insistent the image. Clepsydra, water clock, that's the connection here. Since waiting such a changed thing now from this end of the scale, Eight, glisten of rain on concrete. Weak winter sun barely penetrates cloud filter. Thick layer of wet yellow mulberry leaves covers gravel. One day I'll be water, water already mostly am. Knowing this an illusion based on knowing this. And it is now my pleasure to turn it over to Paul Vangelisti. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna read from uh, a book called Motive and Opportunity. It's the most recent book. And um, the last section of the book is called Motive and Opportunity. And it's a, um, Oh, I don't like, it's a detective poem. I hate the word noir. I mean, yeah, noir is great, but it's a detective poem uh, or uh, uh, what they used to call them, uh, a novel of detection. And the chapters are single poems. So I'll read most of the chapters. I'll start at the beginning and go to the end, but uh, I won't read them all. Scene of the crime. Hallway lights likely burned out and the faintest whiff is of ocean. Let me begin again. <clears throat> Scene of the crime. Hallway lights likely burned out and the faintest whiff of ocean coming this way. You stop in a doorway, cheek on cold plaster and wait. You sense the story has no ending. The heart shadows whom it will turning right or left in the gloom. And what's probably about to happen, is it part of the intrigue or just the kind of coincidence you've learned to distrust? There, something dragging and a warmish sensation before the tang of salt air. Saturday morning. You tried the doorknob again, a few minutes after six, the first Saturday in March. You force yourself to breathe, nudging open the door. How easily will you find it? You step into the wide kitchen off the porch, light unfolding over treetops along the hill. You begin to feel almost at home, like turning on the radio, putting on coffee and going back out to fetch the paper from the driveway. Who knows? Shifting your eyes to the empty sink, row of cupboards, glint of glass door next to the fridge. You're breathing a little easier now, almost certain that you're alone. Jeopardy. The crime always feels like yours, that you'll gamble happiness, your own and everyone else's, just to understand, to uncover some mysterious combination of thoughts, images, commonplaces, adding up, you hope, 
to nothing less than a confession. As for motive, one might as well question the point of dereliction or evil itself. Late. Did you say that you've been here before and that somehow eases the shock, the tawdriness of what you discovered, nudging open the door with your elbow, following the traces of blood out back into the well-kept yard of roses, avocado, and lemon trees? Does it get easier, maybe familiar, that final gesture, the position of the hands in relation to the rest of the body? And that question you hardly ever bring up or almost never consider pursuing. As you step around the rickety gate at the side of the house, you wonder what you expected to find, how late it is, how bad the traffic on your way downtown. Downstream. And giddy, long-awaited sensation of being adrift and slipping downstream toward a pale horizon. At last, the words come. So much lighter, even extravagant, and at once more measured than expected. A declaration rather than a confession, something lingering, hidden from sight. To close the eyes and let the oars slip from your fingers, to close your eyes, and remember the name, the name swirling ahead of that abiding glimpse down river. Neighbors, it isn't that you see any of this heading toward a conclusion, more of a notion, maybe some uneasiness about what's coming with the neighbors like these, with neighbors, pardon me, like these. Not to speculate or look ahead, but considering the cases dragging and so much still to be established. The nature of the crime, for instance, as in your mind, it barely has a name. Too soon to worry about limiting the investigation. Pulling over in front of the rambling property, you can't help being charmed by the shades of bougainvillea, purple, yellow, red, and white that balance the dazzling air and ocean views in a setting like this. Evidence, now you're right in the middle, sleepless nights, a summer cold coming on and little to show for it. A double homicide downtown at rush hour with a handful of witnesses who didn't see a thing. No murder weapon, of course, and those first on the scene didn't do a very good job, except at pointing fingers. Can't even think of starting over with little more than a jumble of rumors and contradictions. It's a wonder you keep at it, it, vaguer by the day, and a crime that seems like everything else just to fade away. No past, no present, but a glum, sprawling future that has us all pretending. Turning over and the sleepless nights paddling around heartache and rain barely audible, flipping pages, whispering of cool sheets and hope that day finally comes, scribbling in a notebook until turning over on your back and a long deliberate breath before bobbing out on the falling tide. Innocence, stale summer seeping through the blinds. On the table, tumblers of melted ice, a pack of Chesterfields, and you trying not to yawn. Does she keep that vague smile when you hear steps on the stairs and pretend to reach for your cigarettes to see behind her? Before the knob begins to turn and the door fly silently open, Aren't you now playing it over? Delicate fingers, her silly, almost innocent grin, your weight shifting from the chair, reaching for your ankle in cold steel that's your only salvation. Why can't you remember what she's about to say, if anything at all? Picture. 
Of course, it's always been a town where no one asks questions. And you were here first, even if those times didn't mean so much now. The contradictions keep piling up, the days getting longer and hotter. So who was it coming up the stairs? Who left traces of pale lipstick, a hint of lavender on the pillowcase? How much does her picture really mean? What can you read in a look or events that harmonize, appear and disappear? Who still believes in accidents when everyone has the same alibi and denies the reason they're even here? Clouds. They hang heavy to the northeast and moving in the sultry light. You pull into a gas station, fill up and buy a Coke cold plastic in your hand. You think of all the times you've stopped to think like this, a sinking sun, night air static with neon in brash impossibility. You pull out south on Glendale, too early to call in, nothing on your phone, too many coffees to give it even a second thought. Traffic's light enough as you poke at the screen and learn the chances of evening showers downgraded again. Panama. You have an extra cup of coffee and a long shower. Couldn't say where the whole thing's leading though. Now you're pretty sure who isn't the murderer. Put on your favorite tie for the drive downtown, a bubbly blue thing you got from your daughter last Christmas. Even showing up early, you'll have to listen to a load of crap like, heard you're back from a few weeks in Paris or glad to see you, we thought you'd retired. And then you'll grin and lift your Panama in salute and look for an empty chair. Long streets. The latest break in the case just didn't pan out. Sketchy evidence and a last minute alibi fed up wife of a to remain nameless politician, ruled out our suspect, another city hall hotshot. It would have been oh so sweet to nail. Leave nothing to chance, go through the notes one more time, leave nothing out of the whole wacky scenario. The players are all there, plenty of opportunity. Maybe skip dinner buy a sandwich and a beer and drive up to the observatory. Looking southwest across the city, mapping left to right the three longest streets in the world, Figueroa, Vermont, Western, endings hazy out there in the evening sun. Maybe something will come as you eat your sandwich, take a sip of beer, considering how much of your life in this lost city begins to make any sense. So what? More than a year since you've gone to a movie, you prefer being home in your easy chair with a book, sensing the night overspread the garden, every time familiar and always a little different. It's a new release, a remake of an 80s classic, itself an adaptation of a sci-fi standard set in LA. The protagonist is younger, prettier than in the original. Everyone's cool and athletic, with about as much appeal as a bag of potato chips. The plot's glib, all happening so fast with dazzling effects, while nothing makes much sense until the last 10 minutes I've been, and by then, it's to care. Driving back home top down, happy to have a huge yellow moon over the hill, and the opening of Miles's So What on the radio. Ensembles, building, motive, and then the three solos, bang, bang, bang. Miles, Coltrane, and Cannonball. Night air all over you as you're just about home. Hall of Records. So who's the father? Punctuating a taxi, pulling out of a space almost in front of the Hall of Records. It's a drizzly Wednesday in March near closing. After too long a lunch at your favorite fish place in Pasadena, 
you decide on a title search of some courtyard apartments at a lost known address. You're scribbling the half slip of paper when the neat little blonde on the wrong side of 40 shows you her baby blues, asking if she might be of help. Back in minutes, carrying a short coat and floppy hat, she places the print out on the counter. You thank her and ask, do you like the rain? Of course, she says. And drinking, you say, certainly more interesting than singing. You barely have to wait five minutes when she pulls up alongside in a green Chevy pickup flashing a smile. Less than a couple of miles down a tree-lined street, she disappeared into a driveway, only to reappear at the door of a duplex without even a glance in your direction. You finish your cigarette and ring the bell. The neat little blonde opens the door and just about bowing, welcomes you in. Valentine. So who then was the father and why the grandmother and the rest begins to fall into place? Her property is only one street over on Valentine and through the garages down a driveway, you're there with no one really noticing. Can't find your pen, must have left it in the car. You cover the half block in a sentence, fish pen and notebook out of your bag and back to the table, all the while running down how it must have happened. The story follows almost as expected. Of course, the alibis will take time to break, but these days you've got nothing but. Once it's pretty much down on paper, time to consider something stronger than coffee. Portrait. A mug's game, old Rosen used to grumble, flicking ash into his coffee cup. Most likely true, seen from far enough away, though it brings little satisfaction to scenes like this. When you first walk in, they're all around the grandmother's body that looks about to say something from the corner of a long sofa. Your turn to write it up, says the captain. Take your time. Don't need it back until the day after tomorrow. Shot through the heart from the smaller sofa where he'd probably sat hundreds of times chatting with his guardian angel who loved him most in the world. Then to the library, the grandfather's off the rear garden. He'd taken his bourbon and soda and sat in front of the old man's portrait, held a mouthful and pistol between his teeth and fired top of his head all over the painting. How much of what you're going to need Mother gone for over 25 years, loving him, pardon me, leaving him and his sister in that big house. Eventually turns up in Paris writing, though probably mostly in French. The report's basically preliminary, but how to begin? In a fit of blind rage, sure, it will take time to tie up the loose ends and someone like you who reads enough French. Number, in this business, there's always another day and another, the case winding down, tomorrow's a lazy afternoon of reading or napping or a long walk along the river. A life like any other, an Irish friend liked to say, expert in afternoons. Once in a great while, time slows to a crawl like summers in high school, no clue who you are, only the awful sense that it might ever be this way. Think it through, get it all down and cross out much of what you've written. Over the years, you've learned to listen, but it helps only so much. Nothing's changed. The stakes remain pitifully small, remote by any reckoning. You get up to have some water, a cup of coffee, wondering where you managed to put the woman's number why it wasn't there in your notebook last night. Thank you. Have you all gone away or are you all here? I'm there here. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Dennis, that was stunning. I really 
really appreciated that. Um, it's so, so wonderful to hear you read. Um, thank you also to our audience for, for coming. I really appreciate having you here. Um, I hope to be able to see many of you in person sooner rather than later. Um, but I think, uh, I think that's about it for the evening. We'll just go ahead and wrap it up. Um, and I just, I just like to say, th I, I feel very frustrated that I see so many people who, uh, you know, who are here, if, if here is the right word, and I feel frustrated to not be able to say hello to everybody, but so hello, and I'm sorry about the format, but I, but thank you, and it, it, I wish that I could have actually seen you, if yeah. not in person, then at least virtually, but very much appreciate it, thank you. Yes, thank you all, and again, thank you, Quentin and uh, Jimmy, for uh, doing the technical stuff to make that. Quentin and Jimmy, thank you both. It's our, it's our pleasure. And yeah, special thanks to Jimmy Vega, who's uh, behind the scenes with us tonight. Um, so thank you, everyone. And I think um, that's, that's about it. I hope to see everyone soon. Bye. 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 Bye.